Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of September 5th, 2022. The weekly top three is a regular segment on the Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the project's page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the Weekly Top 3 also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, In the wake of Revenue Commissioner Lucinda Mahoney's resignation, we explain what we will be looking for in her successor. Second, we discuss why the AKLNG project is testing the outer limits of the theory of if you throw enough money at it, they will surely come. And third, we explain why our reaction when someone from government asks, what are you willing to invest in a new program is first tell me who you propose to pay for the investment, then we can talk. And now, let's join Michael. We're going to start off here with Brad and talk a little bit about the resignation of the uh, Commissioner of Revenue. Now, you'll be, if you've been paying attention, you realize that this is the third or fourth commissioner that has resigned here in just the last few months. And uh, uh, I don't know what that portends, but we'll see what Brad has to say. Good morning, Brad. How are you? Michael, I'm doing great this morning. How about you? You know, it's a. It, I just had a beautiful three day weekend. If it could have been a four day weekend, that would have been so much better. Um, but it is what it is, and here we are uh, diving back into it. We've just rolled our sleeves up, and we're nose to the grindstone, baby, nose to the grindstone. So uh, first things first, uh, the Linda Mahoney, uh, the uh, resignation of the uh, the uh, commissioner of the Department of Revenue. And you've got some thoughts on this. And again, I want to add, ask the question of what does it mean in the scheme of all the commissioners who have resigned, Corey Feige and more? Does that have any significance in your mind? Let's talk a little bit about it here and get your uh, get your hot take. Well, let's, let's, let's take the broader issue here a little bit later. But I, I want to talk specifically about the Commissioner of Revenue first. Lucinda Mahoney, um, not many people have heard of her along the way. She's not uh, she's not given a lot of high profile speeches and she's not uh, not really been out in front. She was for a while uh, when the, uh, the legislator legislature's uh, uh, fiscal working group uh, was meeting. She made a couple of presentations before them. But other than that, she's not been out there in front. But the, the, the revenue commissioner is a is a critical part, in my view, uh, of, of how government operates and, and how government affects uh, Alaskans. There's there's two parts to the to the job. One is the day to day administering the revenue code, administering the department, administering the various uh, various aspects of uh, of what the department does, and, and that's certainly important. But to me, the bigger issue is, uh, is is what the commissioner does in terms of setting the agenda or setting the tone or or looking at opportunities, lo- looking at issues going forward, and trying to. Uh, Trying to anticipate them and, and be responsive to them, it is it, it is incumbent, I think, on a commissioner to think about the long term, to think about ways in which revenue can be gathered more equitably than it is at any given point in time, with a lower impact on the economy, uh, with a, with more uh, uh, a softer uh, take uh, from Alaskans and from Alaska government for Alaska government and and constantly be thinking about how to improve more equitable, lower impact, how to improve uh, uh, the the impact of, of revenue on uh, on day-to-day Alaska life and day-to-day Alaska uh, business. And hopefully she's been doing that behind the scenes. When when we 
when we saw, you know, the tip of the iceberg, maybe when she did the presentations to the legislative fiscal uh, fiscal policy working group, there was some indication in in those presentations that there had been a lot of spade work done in thinking about the future. Uh, when the fiscal policy, uh, when the fiscal model that the Department of Revenue has developed uh, was first developed and, and has been posted, updated in April, um, there's an indication there that there's a, been a lot of thought given about ways to do the Alaska revenue uh, system better. Of course, it depends on the governor. I mean, the governor ultimately has to approve uh, whatever changes are going to be recommended by the Commissioner of Revenue. But the Commissioner of Revenue really needs to dig in and think about that issue and make recommendations to the governor, even if behind the scenes, make recommendations to the governor and be prepared to to make recommendations and to talk through with the legislature better ways of doing it uh, going forward. We're in a situation right now where we've become entirely dependent on revenue from for oil and from PFD cuts. I mean, right. We've, we've got the other half of, of, of Hammond's uh, fiscal plan, the the half intended for government that's spending in the government, but but the additional amount uh, we're taking right now is coming out of middle and lower income Alaska families through PFD cuts. There are much better ways to do that. There are much more equitable revenue approaches. There are much lower impact on the Alaska economy uh, revenue approaches out there, um, and and the revenue commissioner is the person is 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 the person responsible in government uh, for spending those up. So. It, it's important to me, it's, I think it's important to Alaskans, it's important to me from a policy standpoint that, that we get somebody in there who not only can administer the department on a day-to-day -day basis um, and you know make the decisions that need to be made about appeals and all that sort of stuff that's going on under the revenue code, but somebody who's a leader and a, and a thought leader in pushing forward on thinking about different ways, better ways to develop revenue. If we're not going to bring spending down, and you and I have talked on the show a lot about that and the fact that there's a lack of political will, and even in this election cycle, there's a lack of political will really to right. talk about bringing spending down to the levels. If we're not going to bring spending down, we need to be thinking about more equitable approaches to developing revenue. Some of that is looking at the old tax code and see if there's additional uh, uh, pieces there that, uh, that can be changed to increase the revenue. Uh, some of it is looking at uh, uh, alternatives to uh, uh, better ways to raise corporate revenue. Uh, we've not done, we're not doing a particularly good job there either. I mean, we've got this huge Hillcorp loophole uh, that's letting Hillcorp get away with paying $100 million less in taxes than, than, uh, than BP did just because of, the, of its corporate, corporate form. Uh, but there's also better ways if we're going to raise money from individuals, and that's what we're doing through PFD cuts. If we're going to raise revenue through it from individuals, there's also better ways of doing that. And the revenue commissioner is where that buck stops. It, stop, it, it, it is their responsibility, I think, to develop those better ways, to recommend them to the governor. The governor ultimately has to propose them, and you have to have a governor that's, that's, that's responsive to them and, and will consider them and push them. You have to have a legislature that's willing to enact them, but you have to have a revenue commissioner who's willing to do the spade work to develop them uh, yeah. and put them out there in front of the governor and put them out there in front of the legislature and explain them and push them uh, uh, to, uh, to, achieve, to achieve that more equitable approach. And, I, and that's the revenue commissioner. So right. I, think, I, think, I think getting the right person in there uh, going forward, well, if, the Dun if the Dunleavy administration continues, I think the, getting the right person in there is critical. So, I mean, now that you've laid out all the groundwork for that, do you have, I mean, are there any suggestions, any waiting in the wings, any, uh, you know, any, any picks if you're going to, I mean, this is like, I feel like we're doing fantasy football here, but I mean, is it, are there any picks that you would like to see in that position? Um, if you had the dream team, I mean, who would it be? W what are your thoughts? Oh, I don't. Um, it, Brian Fector, if you read, uh, if you read Landfield's entire column from Sunday, he has a, uh, I think he mentions Brian Fector in that column, or maybe another, uh, as uh, as one of those having uh, having the inside track. Brian is currently the deputy commissioner uh, of revenue. Brian was in OMB, I think. Don, if Donna's if Donna's listening, she can confirm or deny that. But I think Brian was in OMB at one point, um, and uh, and has done a, a a very good job. He was responsible several uh, iterations ago for developing the ten year plan. 
Uh, and I thought he did an excellent job developing the 10-year plan. And the 10-year plan is where the administration looks out over the next 10 years and talks about the issues that they're facing, talks about spending uh, trajectories, talks about revenue trajectories, and tries to lay out the uh, lay out the options. And I thought Brian was, I thought that 10-year plan that Brian did uh, was a particularly good one in terms of being transparent and talking about all of the all of the different issues. So he demonstrated in that 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 he's got a good grip uh, on uh, on on the various pieces, and right. that's the type of person that's the type of person you need. But there may be others, and I don't I don't mean to I I don't mean to give Brian the kiss of death if 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 right. that's it, if, if my endorsement would do that. You mentioned him on this show immediately. He's uh, persona non grata in Juno. As soon as, <laughs> as soon as the word comes out on this show, you know that's all there is to it. Well, no, but he's he's, he's but I'm sure there are others. And and you know maybe maybe legislators or former legislators. I know Anna McKinnon is not the right person, <laughs> given given her uh, history in uh, in the legislature. And that was that was the rumor as uh, as either OMB director or revenue commissioner at one time. So. There, there are people who are and people who aren't, but but that's the kind of criteria that you really you really want to look for in a revenue commissioner. Somebody who's going to every day when they get up be thinking about how can I make this revenue, how can I make the state's revenue more equitable, and how can I make it lower impact on on both Alaska families and on Alaska business. And they've certainly got a lot of work to do because we've got we've got a code now or we've got a system now. That is the most in, in, inequitable has the is the most right. regressive of any in the nation, and uh, and as as Iser has told us, has the largest adverse impact on the overall economy of any revenue options that uh, that certainly they looked at. And as another point in Brian's favor, apparently according to Donna, he was also the recipient of Bert Stedman's "That's Just BS" comment. So <laughs> apparently that is uh, that's a point in his favor as far as that goes. All right. Well, number one. Uh, all right. Number one, that pick is going to be very important. Let's uh, let's do a little tweet, a little uh, 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 test drive here on number two, giving us the uh, giving us the preview. And that, of course, is Alaska's LNG project. And uh, of course, this got a lot of press under uh, Bill Walker. That was his big claim to fame and what he wanted to do. And uh, and everything else, but now uh, some senatorial support from both uh, Senator Sullivan and Lisa Murkowski. Give us a tease here before we uh, jump to break. Well, we're testing the theory of if you throw enough money at something, even though the economic economics of it aren't good, if you throw enough money at it, will will they come? Can 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 you do the project if you throw enough money at it? Um, and there there's a piece of the. Uh, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, the recently passed federal legislation that is meant to support the Alaska LNG project in a way that that I just I wouldn't I wouldn't support. But nonetheless, uh, uh, Lisa pushed for it and Dan supported it. And uh, and and it, it's going to test the theory of if we throw enough money at it, can we actually get this project? Can we actually get this? What was what was Howard Hughes's plane name? Is the Spruce Goose, the one that Goose. never flew? Yeah. Uh, can we actually get this Spruce Goose off the ground? So we're, we're going to be talking about we're going to be talking about that in the next segment. Hey, it flew like four and a half feet off. The, it <laughs> flew off the water. I mean, not for long and not for far, but it was it got at least four feet off the water. We're jumping back into it uh, and ready to dive into number two which uh, is all about the Alaska LNG project and the support we're seeing now from the senatorial, uh, uh, the senatorial delegation uh, to, the, uh, to the Senate, Murkowski and uh, Sullivan, both supporting this piece. Brad, give us, uh, give us what's going on here. Give us your take on it. Well, the world is changing around LNG as a result of the Russian-Ukrainian war and what's going on with Russian gas, or isn't going on as the case may be, with Russian gas uh, into into Europe, it the the dynamics are shifting dramatically. Russian gas that used to go to Europe is likely now going to end up going to China and going to India, two of the big growth markets that uh, that had previously uh, looked to, uh, among others, U.S. sources for uh, for their supply. So we're going to have a re redirection of the Russian supply down into that area. Iran, uh, there's been rumors that Iran and Russia are going to align. Uh, and provide Iranian gas uh, into China, and if all that happens, if if Russia and, and Iran in particular go uh, head toward China, that's going to take up 
that's going to take up the China market, which which over the past few decades has been looked at as the as the big growth market, the big opportunity for for LNG. But it's going to do that realignment is going to do something else. Korea and Japan, which previously have been u- utilizing uh, uh, Russian gas um, and and looking to Gulf U.S. Gulf Coast supplies for uh, for gas, will will in the course of all that will sort of you know become uh, market will 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 become dependent on new sources of supply. U.S. Gulf Coast gas looks like it's going to be redirected to Europe. Uh, the globe just just sort of shifting. U.S. U.S. Gulf Coast gas that previously looked like it was heading toward China and toward the Asian market is going to be redirected to go to Europe to fill the hole there. Um, and so that's not going to be a source of a big source of gas coming over to uh, to Japan and Korea, which are two big consumers. So the question really is, what's going to happen? What's going to happen in non-China aligned Asia, not with non-China uh, with with demand other than other than China, which will be satisfied by Russia. Um, there's a big player. Australia is a big LNG producer. Australia had been looking to China as a, as as its market of opportunity and expansion expansion of uh, of its of its capacity down there to go to China. Now it's looking to Japan and Korea, and that's sort of that's sort of where. Um, Alaska is going to play. Is there an opportunity for Alaska going into Japan and Korea um, against uh, against Australia? Will Australia be sucked off in other directions? Uh, will Australian LNG be directed in other directions uh, and uh, and create an opportunity in in Japan Korea? That sort of that sort of looks like where the the global LNG market is redirecting. Into that, uh, we have the Alaska LNG project that has always been economically uh, challenged. Um, and, and, and there's a huge, I mean, we're talking about $40 billion to build the line and build the kit needed to, uh, to gasify, liquefy the, the gas from the North slope, uh, and get it out to markets as part of the, um, and this is where my, my point about if we throw enough money at it, will it finally happen as part of the inflation reduction act just passed by Congress, there was a piece in there, not surprisingly, given that Murkowski was involved, there was a piece in there directed at Alaska. And in the uh, Peninsula Clarion article that we were just talking about, it's, it has this. Funding got a major boost under the Federal Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. Well, actually, that was an act before the Inflation Reduction Act. Through that legislation, which Murkowski helped spearhead, the LNG project now has access to an existing loan guarantee program program that will provide a roughly $26 billion funding backstop. The project's total capital costs are estimated to be around $38.7 billion. So we now have federal funding, a funding a funding source, a funding backstop for three quarters, 75% of the estimated cost of the LNG program. We keep throwing money at it. That means, that means really to, to make the project go forward the private sector needs to come up with $12 billion, still a big number, but not the, not the $40 billion number that would, that it would take to fund the entire program. So the, the, the real question is, um, uh, it, can we, is there enough money being thrown at this project now uh, to get it, to get it off the, uh, to get it off the mark? The federal guarantee program doesn't, isn't a subsidy program in the sense that the federal money just gives you money and doesn't ask for anything in return. It just backstops private lending, and as a result of the federal of the federal guarantee sitting behind it, lowers the cost of private lending significantly. The risk factor uh, from to private lenders of lending to the program goes down uh, significantly as if you have a federal guarantee sitting behind it. So we have we have all that additional guarantee uh, uh, sitting back there behind the program. The question is, will it lift off? But it's still, I mean, to even get somebody to invest $12 billion in it and to, to get somebody to put up, uh, to take the risk of, uh, even with the federal backstop behind it, to take the risk of the, of the debt on it, the market economics have to work at least somewhat. And, and the eyes, our eyes now should be focused on Japan and Korea and whether we're going to be able to establish ourselves in those markets. We have to make this project work. We have to move a lot of LNG. We have to move. 25, 26 uh, billion uh, uh, cubic feet or billion uh, tons, whatever the whatever the measure of LNG is, tons I think, billion metric tons of of, of LNG 
uh, to, to make even the, the sketchy market economics work. So it's, it's going to be a question whether we can fit that into Japan and Korea. The federal government is, is going to throw a lot of throw a lot of support behind it to uh, is seeming to be prepared to throw a lot of support behind it to try to make it work. Now, what is that going to take for us? I mean, is that going to take a commitment from Japan and Korea to sign for, you know, to, you know, we will take X number of cubic feet of gas from you uh, over the course of a year or two years or 10 year program? What's it going to take to move this forward to make it enticing for somebody to invest that kind of dough? There needs there there needs to be some form of guarantee. Whether it's a guarantee for a hundred percent of the production, though, uh, is is probably a question. That with the federal guarantee setting behind it, um, you know, the banks won't be as skeptical about, uh, won't be as demanding about about commitments uh, as as they might be if uh, if they were at risk uh, for the money. If the federal government wasn't backing up three quarters of the project costs. But there still needs to be a significant commitment behind it to, to attract the $12 billion of equity, uh, 12 plus billion dollars of equity that needs to uh, needs to come into it. So, yes, there's going to need to be some commitments by Japan and Korea. Japan has 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 had a history of being very sharp negotiators uh, uh, in uh, in these issues. They've historically had a significant amount of their supply from Qatar, uh, the Middle Eastern country that has a lot of uh, LNG production. Uh, recently, they've essentially let those contracts expire, uh, thinking that they can they can they could they were in a good market position to get supplies, replacement supplies from the U.S. Gulf Coast. Now, with the Russian Ukrainian situation, they've they've become Japan's become a little exposed. So it'll be interesting to see if if we can fit uh, that market opportunity. To make it work, though, there's going to be a need to least it need to be at least some commitment from Japan and Korea buyers uh, to take uh, to take some amount of the LNG. So you see this again, I guess, as a net positive when it's all said and done. This movement at least moves in that direction. We may see something over the next couple of years on this, and it's it, it's a net positive. But Michael, the federal government's throwing a huge amount of money behind this. I mean, it's it's not like the market. It's not like it works on market economics. Uh, it, it is it is it is it is going to be distorted economics, sort of like the spruce goose that we were talking about uh, before the break. There was a, there was a lot of money behind the spruce goose. It did get off the ground a little bit, but it never flew again. It flew once, um, and and it proved that if you put enough money in behind it, maybe you can get it off the ground once. But uh, but we're going to need we're going to need this thing to be off the ground more than once. Right. Uh, right. In order to attract that twelve billion dollars in equity, it's just Bruce Goose, man. It it uh, flew from one point to another across the bay, and I think it got four feet over the water before it uh, came back down. So, but I mean, you know, don't worry, we only poured billions of dollars into it. I mean, he did, not us, but you know, anyway. Oh, there was a government contract behind it. We'll, we'll get into that in the next in the next segment. But there was a government contract behind that. I'm sure there was money uh, in there somewhere uh, when it was all said and done. Um, let me go back up here, um, to see what, uh, what else is going on. <laughs> Kevin McCabe, this is the quote of the day. Meh, sell it to the Chinese, Bill Walker. <laughs> that was, <laughs> yeah, that was kind of a, that was kind of the shocking, uh, Sep. Uh, that was kind of the shocking, uh, uh, out, outcome of that during the Walker administration is how close, uh, he got in bed uh, with China on this deal. Um, and, uh, that's when I knew that it was almost kind of obsession level stuff at that point. I, you know, I, again, I supported Bill Walker early on. I supported his first run for governor and I supported his second run for governor, um, up until the point where he started to, uh, again, they split the sheets and then joined with the Democrats. At that point, I was a little aghast, but you know, he had a lot of good ideas for an Alaskan LNG project, but it just seemed to completely go off the rails. And uh, that, I mean, you notice how he has been super quiet about it this go around. Well, I don't want to defend Bill Walker <laughs> really on anything, but let's remember that, that, that the ceremony where he signed the agreements with the Chinese was presided over by, by uh, the chairman of the, of the, of the Chinese communist party, the president right. of China, but also Donald Trump. So it's not, it's not like, it's not like it was just Walker out there by himself. This was, that right, was during right. the era when uh, Trump was going to redo all of our Chinese relations and, uh, and, and was pushing LNG, was pushing Alaska LNG as part of that. 
Right. Well, I mean, we need to do something. I mean, uh, you're, I'm sure you're going to get into it, but uh, Peter Machicki is quoted in this article uh, from the Peninsula Clarion about uh, – uh, uh, about this, talking about how people, especially those in the interior with air quality issues and things like that, that they, you know, the Alaskans need to have access to their resources. It's one of the few things that I think I, I agree in part with what Machiki is saying. Um, having lived in the interior for so many years, I can tell you that they are dying for cheap, affordable energy. I mean, not even cheap, just affordable. And especially since we are a resource state, it's kind of ironic that we can't seem to get access to our own resources. When I moved down to Wasilla from Fairbanks, I saved like $5,000 in the first eight months alone on utilities. That was between heat and electricity. I mean, I was spending in the dead of winter, I was spending upwards of a thousand bucks a month just to heat my home and keep the lights on. I mean, that's, you know, and of course, now with the price of oil, we're hearing all these horror stories about people going to fill their fuel tanks and a 500 gallon fuel tank is 2,600 bucks. Yeah, it's no surprise that this is what we're dealing with, that people in the interior, especially, and in some of the more rural offshoot communities could really benefit for some gas, but we've got to figure out a way to do it that doesn't sell our soul, so to speak. Well, they're, they're, they're about to throw a lot more money at it. So we'll see if, uh, we'll see if that, uh, if that moves the needle is federal money. I mean, the problem is we've got such, we've got such small communities that are such a distance away from the resource, uh, the costs of getting it there. I mean, we got the resource, we've got the communities, we got the demand, but the cost of getting it from the supply to the, to the, to the demand is just huge. Uh, it, it's not, there's not a cheap way to do it. And so that's right. the, that's the challenge we, uh, we always face. Yeah, no, I mean, the, the whole discussion between pencil line and full, full throated line and offshoots and everything else. Uh, I mean, we could, uh, you know, we could be providing, uh, we could be providing an affordable for, uh, source of gas to a lot of the communities coming down from the North Slope into the interior and down to the Matsu. But again, it's all going to cost money. But the it, here's the thing, it's never going to get cheaper. You know what I mean? It's, you know, at some point we have to look at who's going to invest in what, but it's never going to get cheaper from here at this well, point. Well, but yeah, yeah, I mean, but the question is, even when it's at its cheapest, is it, is it, is it economic? It's worth it, right? Yeah. Can it has to be it? economically feasible, uh, but we are a good uh, source of gas. We've just got to find a way to pay for uh, the transport to get it there. That's for sure. All right, well, let's move on to number three. Uh, Bill Pop from the Anchorage Economic Development Corporation put out a, I mean, his piece uh, in the ADN talking about where Anchorage is going in the future and where we need to do to attract workers. And what do they suggest? Well, we need to create more signs and more vehicular and pedestrian, uh, you know, trailside signs. And we need to create facades on beautification. And uh, I mean, there's just, again, you could tell Bill Pop works for uh, a government NGO uh, because it's all about the money and you're asking who pays. Hit me with it here. Well, the, it's the headline that got my attention. It, it could have been Anchorage. It could have been Fairbanks. It could have been the state. But the headline is, what are we willing to invest for the future of Anchorage? Who's this we? I mean, we, we, whenever now, whenever somebody talks, you know, down in the state legislature or talks, you know, generally about we need a program to do X uh, at the state level, certainly. What they're really meaning in today's revenue environment, what they're really meaning is middle and lower income Alaska families through additional PFD cuts need to fund, you know, some certain program. Right. Um, but but it's the top 20 percent who's deciding whether to do the program. It's the people who don't have to pay that are deciding whether to do the program. So what what my real skepticism or my real reaction was to this headline, what are we willing to invest for the future of Anchorage. I'm, I'm concerned it's the same thing we see at the state level. It's the top 20% deciding, hey, we need this program to do this, to make our businesses better, to do that. But let's find a way to use a regressive uh, revenue structure. Property taxes are heavily regressive. Let's find a way to use a regressive uh, revenue structure to pay for all this investment and push the cost of middle and lower income Alaska families and let the top 20% skate. The the what what I've what I've come to what I've come to realize when I read these is I want to know who the we is. I want to know who pays before <laughs> we start before we start going down these programs, before I even hear, even listen to the remainder of the argument about 
about how great the program is. Who's right. pay, who's going to pay? And then let's go talk to them, the people who are going to pay to see if they want that program. I mean, Medicaid expansion has ended up being at the at the foot of the state's portion of it has ended up being at the foot of middle and lower income Alaska families. Did middle and lower income Alaska families were they were they the ones that decided whether to do a Medicaid expansion? Were they were they asked whether they would take a hit, whether it was well, okay with them to take an additional hit in their PFD in order to fund Medicaid expansion? No, it was decided by the top twenty percent and by the you know by the hospitals and by the medical community. Hey, we want Medicaid expansion because guess what? The docs are going to get all this additional money, federal money that's going to come in from Medicaid expansion. But there is a state cost to it, and the state cost is pushed to middle and lower income Alaska families through additional PFD cuts. So, my reaction to this headline, my reaction to every headline anymore about hey, this is a great program. What are we willing to invest uh, for the, for the future? My initial reaction is who's the we? Who's going to pay for it? And let's go talk to them and let's ask them. Uh, if they're willing to, uh, to 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 pay the money for uh, for this great program that's been dreamt up by somebody. Well, and not even to mention the fact of what they're suggesting that they be paid for. I mean, that's even that's even the worst uh, when it comes down to it. Ironically, the uh, Medicaid expansion, that's all at the feet of Bill Walker, too, on top of that, by the way. Just in case you were forgetting the boondoggle of LNG and the uh, uh, expansion of Medicaid, all Bill Walker's uh, deal uh, for sure. Um and and Bill Walker's funding mechanism was PFD cuts. Bill Walker's yeah. funding mechanism was was put it on the backs of middle and lower income Alaska families. Yeah, no, that's the answer. And again, if you look at this article and the things that they're talking about, you know, here's some simple suggestions for competitive improvement includes, you know, reducing the number of ground level parking lots, uh, setting up benches and a few planners outside of businesses, you know, creating clear districts and neighborhoods to create a sense of place and arrival. I mean, these are Again, this is like a central planner's wet dream. Everything that they're suggesting there. I mean, setting aside the whole who pays for it. I mean, you look at the stuff and you're like, who who writes this stuff up? This is what's going to draw workers to Alaska. If we have a bench and a bu bucket of flowers outside of a business, that's going to solve it and make it more t more beautiful for us to. I mean, I, who who dreams this stuff up? Well, <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I uh, they, they, I think they went to Oklahoma City. Uh, I think there was a delegation that went to Oklahoma City and looked at what Oklahoma City had done to attract additional uh, investment and 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 make their downtown more uh, attractive. And, and Oklahoma City's uh, done a good job of that. Uh, and so, you know, maybe maybe they think benches do it. But but you're exactly right. It's a central planner's dream, and it takes a central planning department to figure out, you know, where those benches ought to go and what how how we ought to name the districts. Um, so we're, we're setting up another bureaucracy to do it. And then somebody has got to pay for it. Right. And, right. and I swear, I swear, if you ask middle and lower income Alaska families, the ones who have ended up paying for Medicaid expansion, the ones who have ended up paying for a variety of additional programs, I swear, if you ask them, do you want to pay for this program through additional PFD cuts? The answer would have been no. But the top 20 percent, the ones who make the decision, the ones in the legislature and in the and in the government who are making the decision are going, hey, we got this great idea. You know, we can we can, you know, put planters or we can, you know, put, uh, 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 you know, put parking garages up and we'll attract more people. We don't have to pay for it because we found, you know, we can use a regressive <laughs> payment mechanism. But wouldn't this be great? Let's try that. Oh, well, that just didn't work out. But hey, let's try something else. Again, right. we don't have to pay for it. <laughs> right. It's, it's somebody else's money. So let's just keep throwing stuff at the wall until something sticks. Exactly right. And that's and that's the problem. We, we, we have people making these decisions in government and we have people making these decisions elsewhere or, or lobbyists uh, uh, urging these decisions, trade associations urging these decisions that don't have to pay for it. If it was their dime, if we had a revenue mechanism that that spread the cost broadly so that everybody had to contribute to it and they were saying to themselves, hmm. Do I want to pay more in taxes in order to in order to fund this? We'd have a lot better judgment going on uh, than we than, than we currently do. Yeah, absolutely. Well, as we look at all this, Brad, it's uh, it's a hot mess, isn't it? I mean, it's a hot mess. Um, 
we need to, we really need to analyze this. We really need to go back again to the fiscal policy working groups uh, plan on, you know, uh, looking at it from every angle, whether it's oil taxes, uh, uh, you know, the cuts, the spending cap, the the personal taxes. I mean, all those things. We need to put everything on the table and just start picking up pieces and parts and figuring out where it all fits because that's the only way we're going to fix this in the long term is if we look at it holistically. Um, that's that's right, Michael. And I and I think the fiscal policy working group in a very short compressed period did a remarkably good job uh, thinking through all those pieces, parts, and putting together uh, a comprehensive package. Hopefully, once we get beyond this election. We'll go back to that and pick it up again and 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 work with it again. Um, I don't have a whole lot of confidence that's going to happen, but but hopefully, I mean, and that's where you to go back to our first point. That's where you need a revenue commissioner who's thinking through these things, who's trying to think every day about finding ways to have a more equitable, lower impact revenue structure. Yeah, well, we've we've got to we've got to do it. We've got to think about it. We should be thinking in these long term prospects, and we should be looking at everything on the table all at once, every bell and whistle that we can pull, every lever, every lever that we can pull, every bell and whistle we can blow. That's what we need to. Uh, that's what we need to be looking at and uh, leaving nothing behind um, and getting it all there. So, uh, Brad, uh, appreciate you coming on board. Any final thoughts? What are you looking at here as you uh, as you watch? As you watch what happened with the uh, congressional race, any thoughts leading up into the uh, the next uh, segment here? Well, I was surprised, along with everybody else, uh, at the number of Republicans who uh, who, who turned on themselves, uh, sort of, you know, the inward pointing uh, circle of fire. Um, and, um, I, <laughs> you know, hopefully they will figure it out uh, uh, by the time that uh, November comes. I suspect they will. They will. But, but but we you may be surprised again. We may get to November and they still are just firing at each other and uh, and and letting uh, well, uh, the Democrats walk away with the seat. I mean, it wasn't just the fact the number of, of Republicans who voted for Peltola. It was the number of bullet voters. I mean, if just the bullet voters had picked uh, Palin as their second choice, you got 20 percent who just were one and done. And whether that was because they were anti-Palin or because they were anti-ranked choice, I don't know. I mean, do you think that they come back from that? Uh, I hope so. I mean, that's, we, we've talked about this in the governor's race, uh, as, as Mike Shower puts it ad nauseum. I mean, we've talked about the importance of not having bullet voters in that, in that, when they, when they vote for that fourth slot, when, whether it was Chris Kirk or, or Charlie Pierce, you've got to rank, uh, when you're, when you're in that fourth slot, that that's the vote. That's the vote that counts. That's the vote that, yeah. that, that makes the decision. Um, and, and hopefully, you know, this experience has taught people that, that being bullet voters uh, uh, turns the bullet on yourself. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, Suicide voters is what somebody called them. But that's it. You know, that's exactly it. All right, Brad, I'm sorry. We're out of time. Thank you for coming on board. Good to hear from you. We will see you next week. Okay. Michael is always good to, good to talk to you. Thanks. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for sustainable budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.